Okay, so I think for the interest of time, let me just uh, get started with this um, um, the second Agri Forward CDT Science Seminar uh, this year. So I'm very uh, happy to uh, welcome Professor Elizabeth Sklar from University of Lincoln as a second speaker of this year. So she has been uh, one of the most active researchers in agri-food robotics uh, uh, research in UK and probably in the world. Uh, and uh, we have been working together, uh, setting up this UK RAS network uh, task, strategic task group on agri-food robotics. And we have uh, more than 30 academics and industry partners uh, together to make an impact in this area. Um, and uh, so she's, uh, she, she's one of the most uh, the advanced experts in the area of agri-food robotics. I'm very much uh, looking forward to learning uh, her perspective about agri-food uh, robotics research. So her topic today is uh, practical methods for shared decision making in human robot teaming. So I think I'm going to start sharing the screen and uh, give the screen to uh, Elizabeth. Can you take it over? Yes. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes, everything working fine. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Fumia. And um, glad to be here today. So my name is Elizabeth Sklar. I'm a professor in agri-robotics. I'm based at the Lincoln Agri-Robotics Center, which is part of the Lincoln Institute for Agri-Food Technology at the University of Lincoln in the UK. I also hold a, a visiting position as a professor of robotics at um, King's College London in the Department of Engineering, where I was for um, a number of years before moving to Lincoln last year. So um, I'm going to talk today about uh, research in, um, that I've been doing in my group for quite a while, um, building on probably last 10 years or so of research, um, looking at practical methods for sharing decision making, focusing particularly in human robot teams. Um, so a little bit of structure for my talk. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background um, on agent-based systems, which is where you know my background is in AI and robotics. And um, on the agriculture side, I um, on, on a um, learning curve, having come to Lincoln um, previously, my research has been applied in, in other areas of medical domain, search and rescue. Um, and I always thought that agriculture was really the killer app for, for robotics. Um, and so I was really excited to be able to come to Lincoln and, and work on that specifically. Um, but I wanna start with a, a little bit of a background on, on agent-based systems and just, um, you know, this is a CDT talk, so I thought it would be good to fill in a little bit of the background, which um, some of you may be familiar with and some may not, so please bear with me. Um, and then I'm gonna focus on um, three particular aspects of decision-making uh, and highlight some of the projects that I've been working on in which we've um, used these methods for making decisions. Um, and uh, let's keep going. So to start with, um, here's a picture of a canonical picture of a robot um, from the agent's perspective. Um, and the idea is that you have, you know, this, this, this robot, which has some kind of sensors, which it can use to sense the world. Can it see things? Can it um, hear things, you know, depending on what kind of sensors it has. And it uses that sensory information to make decisions about what I should do next. And it has knowledge about its own self. So it knows what it has capable of doing and it can use that information to decide to decide what to do. Um, and depending on you know, what the um, configuration is of the robot, the things that it can do might be movements, might be saying something, might be um, you know, moving a manipulator. Um, the point here is that the robot can be viewed from a, a control standpoint as an embodied intelligent agent. The fact that it's embodied means that its environment is in the physical world. Um, one of the key um, features of being an agent is that it's what's called goal oriented. Um, so it, it decides what it wants to achieve and then it makes decisions about how to achieve that goal. 
We talk about decisions being autonomous, meaning that um, even if the agent gets information input from other agents or from humans, ultimately the agent itself makes the decision about what to do. Um, and its decisions are rational, meaning that um, it's always looking to, um, to survive. Um, it won't make decisions that will reduce its utility in the world. And I'll talk a little bit about utility um, in a minute. So there's some fundamental um, components about agent-based modeling, which are, are sort of the agent-based paradigm. I just want to throw out a little bit of notation because you might hear me talk about these terms uh, in some of the coming slides. Um, so very simplistically, we talk about an agent existing, you know, I mentioned a robot exists in a physical environment, and we make the assumption that we can model the environment as a state. And anytime um, something changes in the environment, we can create a new state of the environment. And there's a lot of uh, detail about how states can be defined and how you would distinguish one state from another. Um, but for simplicity's sake, think of, of the paradigm of using a chessboard and every legal configuration of players of pieces on the board can be considered a valid state in the environment if the uh, environment is for playing chess. In the real world environment, like a robot driving around a farm, of course, states uh, can be, uh, are more it's more difficult to distinguish one state from another. Um, and so there's, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of details theory about how one might distinguish that, but we're not gonna worry about that detail here. We're just gonna assume that we have some way of representing a state and distinguishing one state from another. Um, another thing that's important when we talk about making decisions is associating a utility with each state. Um, and the reason that we want to be able to do that is because we normally want to be able to evaluate one state as being better or worse than another state. Um, so agents can define what we call a preference order by assigning a utility to um, each state, and then it has an inherent understanding of whether one state is better than another. Um, now, we don't need to imply that the utility is universal. Every agent may have different evaluations of state. So as long as the agent within itself knows how to evaluate one state better or worse than another, um, we're generally okay. Now, in order to transition from one state to another, the agent can perform any of several actions. The action would be uh, specified by what kinds of um, actuators the robot has, or does it have, uh, you know, talking about wheels or moving an arm around. So any, any of these actions we can enumerate um, and the idea is that um, if the agent is in a given state and it performs an action, then it will um, potentially move to another state. Um, in a deterministic environment, everything the agent does contributes to moving from one state to another. So if we start in state SJ, the agent performs action I, then with the probability of one, with absolute certainty, the agent will move into state J, S, J prime. Now the real world is not deterministic. So we never have this absolute certainty that if you do a particular thing, you're always gonna end up in a particular next state. We have lots of things that are fairly certain, um, but most of the time um, things are, there is some amount of uncertainty, which means that the probability of moving into state S prime, S, J prime, having performed action A, I in state SJ is gonna be some number between zero and one. So yes, the real world is rife with uncertainty, but that is actually what makes it fun. Um, and that's what I think makes robotics fun, particularly robotics in the um, exciting environments like agriculture. So I mentioned about uh, one of the key points of being an agent is that agents are uh, goal-oriented. Goal um, that means that they defined end states for sequences of actions. And agents say, if I perform these actions, then I will end up in this particular state. And sometimes the agents have to, you know, they make some plans for sequences of actions to follow, but, if, but especially if the agent is embodied in the physical world and uh, there's some uncertainty, say other agents or other actions going on uh, that reduces the certainty associated with it moving from one state to another, um, the agents may have to um, change what their plan is along the way. 
So in order to make that a simpler process, what we often do is define sub goals. So even though if we have a way of saying, well, I wanna be here at the end, in order to get from here to here, I'm gonna get here first and then here first and here first. And I may not decide the whole way to get here. I'm gonna decide what my sub goals are. These can be thought of as waypoints following a long path, for example. Um, how do I achieve each of the sub goals knowing that the collection of sub goals will get me to the final goal? So this is what's going on uh, inside the sort of planning operation of the agent. Um, now, when we look at decision-making, again, I mentioned the idea that we wanna associate an, a utility with the different states. Um, you can as associate a utility with, with an, a goal state, but you can also associate a utility with sub goals along, along the way. Um, now, a self-interested agent only looks at those goals from its own perspective. It says, this is what I want and I don't care how I get there or how I, you know, what I might, what um, harm I might inflict on the world or other agents in order to get there. I'm only interested in my own utility. Um, usually we're actually more interested in benevolent agents, agents that say, well, okay, I can do this. It might look good for me, but how does it look for everybody else? Usually uh, we're in a situation where we wanna be building an agent or a robot that's going to um, inhabit society in some way, whether it's a group of robots or a group of robot, robots and people. So we want the agent to be able to look at the utility um, as a whole. So we look at social, the idea of a social agent. So when a robot interacts with others, robots, virtual agents, humans, um, it's considered a social agent. Now, uh, I'm going to just make a, a side note here that when we talk about interacting, we're distinguishing from um, things like avoiding obstacles. So if you have um, entities in the environment that are, are not movable, are not things that you can communicate with or have uh, any kind of influence on, um, we're gonna consider those obstacles and we're not interested in those here. We're only interested in um, other agents in the environment where agent is a, a generic term to refer to either physical robots, virtual agents or humans. So other agents working in the same environment um, and uh, if they're achieving common goals, um, then they're gonna be working together. Um, so some goals uh, in fact can only be achieved by interacting with others because say if you have you know, a, a two robots that work together in a warehouse, one has an arm where it can pick things off of a shelf and another uh, robot has a, a carrier for moving things around, they have to work together because the robot with the carrier doesn't have the arm and the robot with the arm doesn't have a carrier. So that's an example of um, <coughs> two robots that are required to work together. In order to work together in this kind of social environment, the agents must have a number of abilities, including the ability to communicate. So send messages to others and receive messages from others, the ability to cooperate. So the ability to I identify and achieve what are common goals. Um, ideally, they have the ability to coordinate. So you wanna avoid duplication of effort. You wanna avoid uh, colliding into each other um, and negotiating. So you wanna be able to decide together what goals to achieve, how to achieve those goals and how to distribute the effort so that the overall um, welfare of the team or the group is, um, is improved by achieving the goals. In order to do that, um, we'll look at the field of decision-making. Now, I'm gonna very, very briefly touch, this is a huge field and I'm gonna very briefly touch on what, um, what we mean by making decisions. Um, there's a lot of work in the area of game theory, which focuses on making individual decisions. I'm looking at, um, you know, how does, how does one agent decide about what to do? Um, we're more interested in uh, the work that I do on social choice theory. So the idea of how do you combine um, the interests of multiple agents to work together to make group decisions. Um, and it could be, you know, a group could just be one agent, one robot and one human working together, or it could be a team of robots, a team of humans and robots, um, doesn't matter. The work I'm going to talk about employs three different methods. I'm going to highlight three projects, one that uses voting mechanisms, 
one that uses auction-based mechanisms, and one that uses computational argumentation. So I'm going to give a very brief overview of what each of these are, and then I'll highlight the three projects. So voting mechanisms, um, you know, if you've ever participated in an, an election for um, a public official, then uh, you have participated in a, in a voting um, process. And um, the general idea with a voting mechanism is that you have a number of options, which I've got listed in, in uh, listed here as Omega. So you have a number of different um, options that you can pick. Uh, and the idea is that each participant in the, in the voting has a preference over options. And there are different ways that you can um, specify what that, that preference is through the voting. Um, so one is to just select one option, vote for one candidate. Um, some uh, other voting mechanisms allow selection of um, multiple candidates, but giving a preference order. Um, and so there's the behavior of the voters. And then there's the behavior of what is the mechanism for settling or you know, making the decision about the election. Um, and so there are, there are many different ones, but I'll highlight two. So one is preference aggregation. So this is um, what's called a social welfare function, and it takes um, account of the voter preference orders and then produces a social preference order across all the voters. Um, another uh, common method is simple majority, so the cho which is called a social choice function, which elects one winner um, by taking account the preference ordering of each of the um, each of the, the voters. Um, so that's voting mechanisms. Um, a slightly more complex system is an auction-based mechanism. Um, now, the um, the one of the key differences between a voting mechanism and an auction mechanism is with voting, even if you're indicating a preference order, um, you don't have to assign a value to each of the choices that you make. Even whether you're making one choice or multiple choices, you're just saying, which do I think is, is the best or which do I think is better than another choice? Whereas with auction-based mechanisms, the idea is that you associate a value with a particular decision. And it's not just an internal value, so it's not just um, what the individual agent thinks, but it needs to be a value that is absolute because it will be compared with other participants. So um, if anybody has participated in an auction on eBay, for example, uh, you'll know that um, you know, the, the currency that people use, it you know, might be dollars, it might be pounds, um, but there's an absolute metric for uh, being able to communicate what is the value of a particular good that you're bidding on. Um, and so we can look at the same kind of thing with decision making, but the idea is that you have this currency, you have some kind of value that you're using to, um, for participants to be able to compare um, bids with other, their own bids with bids of other participants. Um, and there are a number of different ways in which bidding can happen. There are a number of different ways in which awarding happens. So bidding is when all the participants who um, want to um, uh, express a preference for a particular option, um, they provide information about how much what they're bidding on and how much the bid is worth to them, um, how much the option is worth to them. And then there's a mechanism that does the awarding that basically what's called settles the option by deciding um, uh, how do we look at the different bids that we've accumulated and how do we make an award based on that? And there are many different ways of doing, doing that awarding. And I'm not, um, you know, as I said, I'm not gonna go into the, the details of these things, but I just want to give you kind of an, an overview um, here and point out that the key difference between the voting and the auction is that the voting, um, you're just uh, expressing your own private, um, preferences, whereas with auctions, the value that you're associating with it does need to be expressed in absolute terms so it can be compared with others. Um, in some of the work that I'm going to share with you using auction-based mechanisms, we're using that for um, deciding how a team of robots can distribute tasks amongst each other. And with that work, we explored um, uh, three different types of auctions. So these first three single sequential item ordered sequential single item and parallel single item. In all of these cases, um, uh, agents are bidding on one particular item um, on its own. 
Another kind of auction is a combinatorial item, a combinatorial auction in which agents can bid on bundles of multiple items. Um, so uh, for example, with a single item auction, you might be bidding on a car, um, whereas with a combinatorial auction, you might be bidding on, well, I want a, a combination of a particular car with say a particular, um, that has a particular color or, um, some particular combination of things that that go with that uh, with that item. Okay, and the last decision making mechanism that I'm going to talk about is something called computational argumentation, which comes uh, out of the logic and philosophy communities and has been um, uh, adopted by the computer science community now 20 some years ago. Um, but it's um, it's a more complex mechanism than voting or auctions um, for the key reason that there's some preamble that can be associated with making what's effectively a bid. The idea is that when you express a preference for something, that preference needs to be backed up by evidence that you have to justify why you believe in that preference. And so we look at what's called an, an argument, and I, there's lots of notation, but I'm not gonna clearly go into that um, today, but just to give you an idea that when you have a, an argument, it's formed of a set of reasons to um, defend a particular or to support a particular conclusion. So this conclusion would be basically the decision that I'm advocating. Um, and this S is a set of reasons, set of things, set of evidence, um, called premises uh, often in the literature that says, this is why I think this particular um, conclusion is the, is the right thing to do. Um, computational argumentation is, is particularly attractive right now because there's been an increase in interest in being able to explain decisions made by AI to users. Um, and there's a very natural pairing from computational argumentation to um, AI-based explanation. And I'm gonna uh, cover that in the, kind of the last part of my talk. Um, there's, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but let's just say if you look at sets of, um, of premises, they can support conclusions. They can also what's called attack conclusions. So, um, and there's, when you put together the arguments of multiple people, which are made of different sets of uh, premises, you can end up um, being able to evaluate quite effectively um, whether the group has support for or um, against a particular conclusion. Now, in order to use the basis, the knowledge representation that argumentation provides, in order to use that in a multi-agent interaction, um, a method's been developed that's called argumentation-based dialogue, which is often framed in the form of a game in which, uh, say, the two agents um, make moves, they can pass information back and forth. And as they do that, they can um, agree or disagree with the individual things that, that different agents make. And one of the common kinds of um, uh, dialogues, di dialogue games that agents use is something called a persuasion dialogue. Um, and so the idea here, and this is a, a simple uh, illustration where you have two agents, we have one in the clear circle and another in the gray circle. So they, it's a turn-taking game. So the first agent starts by saying, well, I believe in this particular thing. It's an abstract um, belief B. And the gray agent can say, yes, I accept yours. I believe the same thing. Um, then we're done, right? So this indicates that we're done. But the, the uh, more interesting case is where the first agent says, I believe B. And the second agent challenges and says, well, why do you believe that? And then there's a process by which the first agent has to defend why they believe it. And finally, there's an option where the first agent might say, I believe B, but then the second agent can say, actually, I believe the opposite. I believe not B. And then again, there could be some just back and forth to try to um, come to some conclusion about um, whether collectively they will um, believe in B um, or collectively believe not B or potentially reject uh, both B or not be, um, and lots of different ways you can go with this. But um, I just wanted to give you really the 
very, very, very quick whirlwind tour of kind of the theory that we're looking at when we um, have applied these different kinds of um, decision making mechanisms to multi robot and human robot teams. Okay, so I'm going to next um, go quickly through three different projects, um, one of which has used voting mechanisms. This was a project um, called Semaphore, um, another project that uses um, auction mechanisms. And the third project, which uses um, computational argumentation. Just keep an eye on the, on the time. Um, OK, so Semaphore is a project that um, is based on a cognitive architecture, which is something called For the Right Reasons. This was work um, done in the 1990s by Susan Epstein, who's a professor of AI um, at the City University of New York. And um, she's written a number of different papers and projects uh, that use for, for doing reasoning about a number of different domains. And initially the work was in game playing. Um, and, uh, but when I met Susan, we started talking about using for, for decision-making with physical robots. And for is a very interesting architecture. It's, it's, as I mentioned, it's a cognitive architecture. And what it does is look at how do people make decisions? And then can we apply that to um, agents and to, in our case, into robots? And the, 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 the basis of four is something called an advisor. And so the idea is that when people make decisions, you often ask other people for advice. What do you think about this car? Should I buy this car? Should I buy this brand? What do you think of the color? What do you think of the ride? What do you think, you know, is it economic? Um, is it environmentally sound, right? Lots of different factors on which you might make your decision, but you might ask lots of different people for their, for their opinions. Um, and so it's the same kind of thing with four. The idea is that you are um, uh, consulting these advisors in, in the, the, uh, the pure implementation of four. Each advisor is effectively, each advisor is effectively a, a function um, that will uh, provide a vote for or against particular actions um, and including with that some kind of rationale that is um, uh, encoded in the um, way the advisor is written um, so that you can build a system that has many, many, many different advisors and the um, decision is made by resolving conflicts amongst um, all the different advisors who participate in making a particular um, decision. One of the very nice things about, about four is that because the reasoning, the rationale for making decision for voting particular things is inherent in the substrate of the advisor itself, um, the outcome can be easily explained and understood by people. Um, so here's a quick overview of how four works. It's a three-tiered architecture um, in which, uh, for those of you who have uh, looked at subsumption architecture, um, the, uh, in the literature, the, the idea is that you have a, an emergency layer or a, a reactive layer or a tier in the case of four that says, okay, here's the emergency, here's the thing that I'm going to do without having to think about it. So I'm going to, you know, avoid crashing into things. I'm going to afford, avoid falling down a hole, um, that kind of thing. Um, the more complex decisions are made at, at tier three, where this is where you need to engage advisors that will produce votes um for or against particular actions and a lot of times more complex actions involve multiple steps so i'm gonna uh, in order to go out this door i need to get up from my desk i need to walk around the desk i need to open the door i need to go out and each of those atomic things becomes a small action um, and so in order to um uh adhere to an advisor that where you've said, okay, my, my next action is to go out the door and you have all these subtasks, then you have this tier two advisor, which um, helps you um, uh, follow all of the subtasks along the way. So that's a very rough overview of how, of how that works. Um, I wanted to illustrate um, uh, some work that we did using for semaphore for doing navigation. Um, and so, Here's a list of some of the advisors that we came up with. So the tier three ones um, are, uh, sorry, the tier one advisors are the ones that avoid getting into trouble. So, so, so don't, um, you know, get too close to a wall. 
Um, victory means that I'm, I'm at my target, so I don't need to keep going because I've, got, I've reached my goal. Avoid walls means I don't want to crash into a wall. Not opposite means I don't want to do the thing I just did because you don't want to get you know, stuck into a hysteresis situation where you, you never get out. Um, and then here's some tier three examples, which, which are a little bit um, more complex to, to, to follow, to complete. Um, so for example, when I'm far away from something, I might want to take a big step um, if I'm far away from my goal. Whereas um, if I'm closer to my goal, then maybe I want to take smaller steps. Um, lots of different detail there, um, which I won't uh, take the time to get into. So we implemented this um, in a simple office-like environment. This is a, a you'll, you're going to see this in several of the slides that I show you. This is a, this this picture probably has a better view of it. It's a top-down view of a map with sort of six rooms, a corridor between them, and we have robots that can drive around in this, in this, um, in this room. Um, what we did for four was that we assumed that the robot has a number of sensors. Each of these blue lines is, is a sensor, and it says, what's the distance to the, uh, it's basically a range sensor, what's the distance to the nearest obstacle in each of these directions? Um, because the robot is heading this way, it has more sensors in front and it has a couple in back, but not, you know, it doesn't cover the whole area as, as well because primarily it's physical body is such that it will want to move forward. Um, so the way four works is that um, you give the robot this, um, you put the robot in this space and you want it to learn how to get from uh, its current location to a particular location. Um, and so, um, we might say, well, we're going to start here and we want to end here. Um, and these green dots just show um, experimentally when we ran some, some different test cases, we, we um, had the robot uh, follow a bunch of small steps to figure out how to, how to get to here. And it does, goes through a lot of trial and error. Um, so you can see that these are things that it tried and didn't successfully get to its, to its path. Um, one of the things that the robot learns in four is what are places that will help me get to where I want to go. And this is uh, what we've labeled as something called, we call it a conveyor. Um, and this is effectively a heat map that says the darker places are more useful because they help us get between different things. Um, so um, in the experiments that we ran with, with semaphore, we learned two different types of of things that I'm gonna highlight here. So one of these conveyors, which I already mentioned, the other thing is a region. So these pink circles represent regions. Okay, a, a larger pink circle says, well, here's a region that is more open. Um, ones that's smaller like this says, well, this is more confined. Okay, um, each of these little dots on the edge say here's a, a way to get in or out of a region. Okay, now one of the things that, um, you should be aware of is that when we gave the robots this task, the robots have no global positioning and they have no map. So um, the idea that the robot learned that this is a big open area is because uh, it detected, it used its sensors to detect these walls. And um, over time, the robot learns more and more, you know, as it moves around its environment, it learns more and more things. Um, so you know, we did a lot of different experiments with semaphore um, and this shows some of the results. One of the things that we wanted to do was be able to compare, you know, how does the, how does the robot do when it has a map versus when it doesn't have a map? Um, how does the robot do when we um, um, don't use all of the different advisors? So we use some combination of advisors just to see which advisors provide more useful information um, than others. And, and this gives you some of the idea of like sort of the success of achieving the kinds of tasks, exploration tasks that we gave the robot. Um, uh, the last thing I want to mention to you about, about Semaphore is these experiments we conducted just by putting robots in the environment uh, without people. Um, but then we conducted some further experiments where we put robots in an environment where we let people also provide advice to the robots. So not just having a set of um, advisors like this, which are only things that are evaluated by the robot, but also introducing some advisors where the human 
um, can provide some input. And I, I didn't enumerate those here, but the, basically the idea, and, and I, this is zooming in on, on the tier one, which is that there are some things, if it's preceded, if the, the name of the advisor is preceded by an H, this means that the human is the one that um, uh, activates this advisor. So this says the human says halt, which means stop completely. This says the human says wait, which says, um, you know, pause what you're doing, you may want to resume, um, for example, and then here's where the human says resume. Um, and so we set up some experiments where we had some robots driving around in a physical arena. This is an overview of that same map that I, I mentioned before. We had three robots um, and we let the robots, uh, you know, we gave them some navigation tasks just like we did in the, in the other experiments, except that we let a human watch on the screen. So the human watched this screen to see where the robots were moving around. And if the human thought that two robots were getting too close together or um, that the human was able to predict that one robot was gonna cross the path of another one and get too close, um, then the human could uh, click on the interface and interject this, this wait, and then the human could click on resume. Because one of the skills that people have is it's easier for people to look at, at an overview task like this and do some prediction than, than it is uh, for, the, for the robots. Um, so we did some nice experiments um, with that as well. So a uh, quick summary of the things that we learned from playing with, with four. Uh, so semaphore for navigation. Uh, the most successful model relies on deliberate exploration um, and spatial affordances. So the idea of, of identifying things like conveyances and regions. Um, and, uh, and we showed that when you do that, um, you end up learning how to navigate um, better than if you don't uh, include this um, affordances information about how the environment um, uh, is structured. Um, and um, with the experiments that we did with human robot tasks, we found that having the human uh, team member providing information can do two things. It can teach the robot um, uh, how to um, uh, improve its performance um, when the, the human input is, is provided um, and the robot um, does better when you have the human helping out in that, in that way. Um, okay, so the second thing that I wanna talk quickly about is multi-robot team task allocation or um, a uh, environment that we developed called, which we like to call Mr. Team. Um, again, similar idea where we have some physical robots moving around in an office-like environment. The space was bigger than the, the one on the previous slide. So we had a bit more space to play with. And we also built a simulated version of this, um, uh, which we um, implemented on a high performance compute node. So we were able to perform lots of different experiments. Um, and basically the idea here is that we have three robots driving around in this arena. And we did a number of different experiments looking at what are the different ways in which you can use auctions to distribute tasks amongst different robots. Um, and uh, not, I'm gonna go through this quite quickly in, in the interest of time, but we looked at parameterizing environments. So, so Prior to our work, there was a lot of work in the multi-agent systems area looking at um, uh, using auctions for distributing tasks, but there were kind of two main things that we have contributed with this work. One is being able to look at the environments um, according to a number of different parameters and looking at how different auction mechanisms match those uh, or don't match those um, parameters. And the second thing was actually implementing this on physical robots, because most work had just been done um, in simulation. Not, not to put a value judgment by saying just, but um, for those of you who have worked in simulation and physical robots, there are a lot of extra things you have to worry about when you're working in the physical domain. Um, so we looked at things like, are tasks, if, if you're gonna assign tasks to robots, are they tasks that can be done with one robot, so single robot task, or are they tasks that require multiple robots to perform? Um, are they tasks that are independent, doesn't matter what order that they come in, or are they constrained? Do you have to do one task before a, another task, for example? Um, and when, when can the tasks be allocated? So do you, not, do you know all the tasks ahead of time before you start executing the task? So um, is, is the allocation environment static 
or is the allocation environment dynamic? Will the robots be executing tasks, some tasks, while more tasks are um, being, being brought in? And so we ran lots of different experiments. We used some different types of auctions um, uh, that have different properties to see whether, is there any particular a combination of auction mechanism and parameterization using these parameters where definitively we can say one option is better than the other? Um, the, uh, top-down view of the um, different of the um, office-like environment that we use um, and some of the tasks here's showing uh, you know we have lots of data people are interested in, in looking at how different robots drove around um, each color is a different robot um, we collected lots of different performance metrics so things like deliberation time how long did it take to allocate the tasks um, comparing different auction mechanisms. So, so round robin, for example, takes no time to deliberate because as soon as you have a task, you just assign it to the next robot in the queue, like a taxi rank, um, whereas these other ones take longer to decide. Um, and is there a trade-off? So if, if PSI, which is parallel single item auction, if that takes less time to uh, deliberate, does it also take less time um, to run? Do the robots collectively travel over less distance? Um, versus something that might take, uh, you know, longer. So SSI, for example, that might take longer to distribute the tasks, but the performance overall may be, um, may be better. Um, and so the thing that we ended up um, doing was some significant ranking, um, looking for significance in the ranking of mechanisms. So for example, um, the, uh, these are heat maps that show uh, data analyzed collectively over quite a large number of experiments um, with different experimental parameters here, which I won't have time to get into. But basically, with each of these squares in this 4 by 4 grid shows a different combination of um, environmental parameter and um, uh, auction mechanism. Um, and this is over deliberation time. So the, the dark is the fastest, um, and the lightest is the longest. So it was clear that regardless of how the environment was set up, um, the round robin always takes the least amount of time to deliberate. Um, and uh, sequential single item auction always takes the longest time to um, deliberate. Now, when we go and look at the, the metric of distance traveled, so if what we're trying to do is optimize uh, for energy, because we want the robots to travel, the team to travel over the least distance, um, can we say definitively that any of the auction mechanisms gives you the best performance? Well, this heat map shows you no. Um, it does indicate some nice things. So for example, the, the shortest distance traveled um, most of the time for, for PSI was for PSI, um, but not all the time, okay? So um, this is a uh, you know one of the takeaway messages that we that we have. Um, so what we found is that within a single environment, different mechanisms produce significantly different results. Um, and between multiple environments, there is no definitive consistent ranking amongst the broad metrics um, computed for each mechanism. Um, and the last thing I'm going to go through again, very quickly, apologize for the the time here. Um, is the application of computational argumentation specifically for human robot um, interaction. And um, so uh, for this, we use three types of dialogues. I already mentioned to you persuasion dialogue. So the idea that you have in, in these experiments, we had one human and one robot. And so we wanted to be able to say, well, the human has their beliefs and the robot has their beliefs. And sometimes they wanna be able to convince one of the other to change their beliefs. So if the human believes B and the robot believes not B, can they, uh, whoever initiates the dialogue, can the robot, for example, initiate the dialogue and try to convince the human that they should change their belief from not B to B. Um, so this is, this is persuasion dialogue and it, it's, it's one of the more common ones. Um, information seeking is when you have the two parties um, where one has information and the other doesn't and wants that information. So the robot has no information about a particular belief, but it believes that the human does. So the robot can initiate an information seeking dialogue and ask the human for that information. Um, and the last type of dialogue that we implemented in this experiment was something called inquiry dialogue, where 
um, it's in, uh, initiated when neither party has information about something. Um, so what we did was we, um, I'm not gonna go into the, um, the details of the theory here in the interest of time. Um, what we did was we ran some experiments with, with people um, where we set up something that we called the treasure hunt game, um, where we had, again, the same kind of office environment that I've shown you before, but hidden in that office environment, we had a number of treasures. Um, and the idea was that the human and the robot had to work together to find the treasures. The robot had a limited amount of energy. So doing an exhaustive search of the whole environment was not an option. Um, and so we set this up in a very structured way so that we could evaluate things the way we wanted to. So we um, structured the game so that there are three decision points. The first decision point is for the human and robot jointly to decide where the robot should go. Um, and I should say that the robot and the human were located um, remotely. So the robot was sitting in this, in this uh, office-like environment and the human was sitting in a separate room with a screen where they had um, a view, an overview of the map of where the robot was driving around and the human had um, was able to get access to pictures that the robot took with its camera, um, but uh, it's not like they were in the same physical space together. So they had to decide where, where the robot should go. They had to decide how the robot should get there. So what path the robot should take. Um, and then once the robot got to the location that they agreed on, the robot took some pictures and sent them to the human and then they had to decide collaboratively what was found there. Um, we ran experiments with two modes. One was what we called human as collaborator, where we employed argumentational, computational argumentation um, and dialogue for the human and the robot to discuss these decision points. Um, and the second one is a more traditional um, kind of environment where human is supervisor, where the human made all of these decisions on their own. Um, we ran with 60 human subjects, both with physical robots and with uh, uh, robots operating in a simulated version of our environment. Um, and we collected you know, lots and lots of different, um, different metrics. Um, and um, I'm not gonna go into the details so much of the, the results here, but the nice thing that, that we were happy about was that we showed that the um, human as collaborator mode um, was statistically significantly better um, than when we were operating in human as supervisor mode. Um, and that counted both for, um, objective metrics that we collected, like what was the distance that the robots traveled, as well as subjective metrics because we um, gave people some surveys. The piece that I wanted to um, follow up with here was looking at, because we chose to use argumentation-based dialogue as a decision-making mechanism, we wanted to analyze what happened with the use of those dialogues. And I mentioned to you earlier that we had three types of dialogues that people could use, either persuasion dialogue, information seeking dialogue, or inquiry dialogue. Um, and we uh, set up you know, a number of different conditions under which these kinds of dialogues would be initiated. Um, and so we wanted to be able to analyze our results and say, uh, you know, were these dialogues initiated? And if they were initiated, did they produce um, agreement. So did they reach agreement? Um, did the human, you know, did the dialogues help? And so the results that we found were uh, uh, showing that it was a positive thing. So for example, um, the percentages in the first three columns of this table, so are the ratio of the number of dialogues of each type to the total number of dialogues. So in the, in the case, let's say the physical robots, um, of, the to of all the dialogues that we had, 56% were persuasion, 28% were information seeking, and 17% um, uh, were inquiry dialogue. The fourth column is the uh, ratio of the total number of dialogues to the total number of decisions. So this says, well, we made 67% um, uh, of the time there was a decision to be made, we engaged in a dialogue. And you'll see if you look at these totals all the way down, that given the opportunity to have a dialogue um, more than half the time, and in fact, in, in many cases, much more than half the time, um, the robot and the human did engage to have a dialogue. So that justifies the reason to even pursue the use of dialogues in human-robot interaction. Um, and then we did some analysis of these different types of, of decision points. So um, I'm just picked the where to go decision point. Um, so 
having the dialogue, you know, the reason to have the dialogue is to try to encourage agreement between the human and the robot. So anytime there was a, an accept, that meant that the human and the robot reached agreement together. Anytime that there was a reject said they didn't reach an agreement. And what we did um, operationally in the experiments is if there was a disagreement and they couldn't come to a conclusion, then we um, reverted to human as supervisor mode and the robot did what the human wanted. Um, so, um, although we didn't tell the people that in the experiment because otherwise they would have not bothered to do the thing because they would have known that their way would have been taken regardless. Um, um, but uh, overwhelmingly the dialogues ended up in acceptance. So this was um, again, a nice thing um, to see. And uh, here's just an example of the transcript I, I showed you um, earlier. There was a little screen we had what was effectively a chat interface between the human and the robot. Um, we had, uh, because we had different experimental conditions, we named the robots differently. So one was called Robot Fiona. Um, and so this just shows something about the dialogue. The robot, we didn't use any kind of fancy NLP. We just had some uh, templates, uh, scripts, where we um, provided information back and forth um, for the robot to be able to communicate with the human. Um, but this just gives an example of, of why uh, how the explanation um, works. So the human has the option to ask, um, you know, the, the, the first question is, where should we go? And the human says, I want to visit, um, visit one room. Um, and the robot says, well, I want to visit four rooms. Um, do you agree or disagree? And so the human can come back and say, well, I want to know why do you want to visit four rooms? Um, and then the robot gives, gives its reasoning. Um, and then the, you know, the system continues. Um, so the analysis we did is, does the explanation help? Um, and it shows that um, the uh, user satisfaction um, was, was increased when the uh, um, explanation was provided. Um, so the um, uh, quick summary is that, um, you know, most of the time users did not challenge um, things, but when they did challenge, um, they were um, able to um, uh, produce um, uh, agreement and um, running out of time. So I'm gonna just come to the quick conclusion here. Um, this shows some of the more recent work that I've done with these different environments and the work that I'm doing now in the, in the agriculture domain is looking at this decision-making um, uh, using the, some of the voting mechanisms and the cognitive architecture, particularly when we're working with, with humans. Uh, we've got some ongoing work using argumentation in the, um, in the medical um, domain. And I previously did some work with the multi-robot um, uh, task allocation applied to emergency services. And now we're looking at doing that um, in terms of doing mapping in, um, in, the, in gardens, in the environmental domain agriculture domain. So um, as I mentioned, this work's been going on for, for a long time. So I've had a lot of different funding. Um, I started doing the work in New York. So I have a lot of funding uh, from uh, National Science Foundation in the States. Um, and then since coming to the UK in uh, 2013, I've gotten some uh, UK funding for this work. Um, and lots of different collaborators just highlight a few here, the main leads on, on some of these um, pieces of work. Um, and finally, um, just to end with the uh, interest in working on um, practical real world problems. And I see I have a typo on that slide. So I'm going to stop there. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. So I apologize for running over. Hey, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, so if you have any questions, you can uh, either type in in the chat window uh, or you can just speak out. So uh, Elizabeth, let me start with my question. So uh, um, you, you talk about a lot of interesting uh, principles and theory of uh, multi-agent systems. And I'm just wondering, what do you think is the first application or maybe lower hanging fruits, agri food industry applications of your approach? So um, one of the things that we're, we're looking at, I mentioned is, is using the multi-robot task allocation for deciding if you have multiple robots in an environment, how can you 
uh, distribute tasks equally uh, so that or equitably so that you end up with an efficient system. Um, and in fact, uh, we have a recent project that's looking at um, applying this in human robot domain. So if you have human workers doing tasks and you want to supplement that with robot workers, can you um, do task assignment where you're assigning tasks to human workers as well as robot workers and, and balance out the workforce? Because of course, one of the issues that we're facing now, um, particularly in the, in the UK, is lack of, um, of laborers to do some of the work like picking, for example, harvesting. Um, and so can we be more efficient in terms of how we assign human workers to do things? And can we um, make set up our environment so that we'd be seamless to integrate uh, robot workers into the mix? OK. Right, so I, I heard a lot of uh, application, like you know, single user controlling multiple robots, like a drones or ground vehicles. Uh, is 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 this kind of application also I mean, the target of your um, of your research? So different types of vehicles. Is that what you know, you're asking? One, one operator is controlling, let's say, ten drones, right? Or you know, one person operating ten autonomous harvesters. So harvesting. you. Yeah, so you, you could have um, uh, multiple, you know, the idea is that the robots themselves are autonomous. So you don't really have a human controlling one. Um, you, you might have say 10 robots and one human in a team together. Um, and you have a mission where they're all assigned different things to do. Um, it may be that the robots are collecting data that they don't know how to interpret. And so they need to um, get help from the human to interpret what's the data uh, that's being collected. So that's like the uh, treasure hunt. Um, and we started doing that with looking at, at pictures of strawberries. So um, there's, you know, robots can identify some amount of visual data visually quite well, but then there's some extra, you know, thing when robots in cluster, when, when strawberries are growing in clusters, for example, that people can pick out quickly and robots have trouble with. So can robots quickly do the easy things and then save a smaller number of hard things for people to do so that you're using the robots efficiently in one kind of task and the people efficiently in the other. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think there's another question, but uh, maybe you can answer to this question uh, from Richard Harvey uh, offline, perhaps. Uh, you can see it probably in the in chat window. Uh, because uh, for the interest of time, I think we need to close this session at 4 p.m. So uh, I'd like to thank Elizabeth uh, uh, delivering a wonderful uh, lecture today. And uh, for sure, he's, she's going to be around for uh, you know list of the CDT projects. So I think uh, we have a number of opportunities to interact uh, in this area of research. Uh, and uh, the next uh, CDT seminar is uh, in one month's time, 19th of March, uh, from the same time by uh, Professor uh, Minyi Sarge. So please don't miss this next uh, uh, seminar as well. Uh, and uh, then I'd like to thank everyone to uh, thank you for uh, participating in this seminar series. Thank you very much. See you next month once again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth.